Welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the complete process of installing MX Linux, which is one of the most stable Linux distributions out there. And so we'll actually be installing MX Linux alongside of Windows. So essentially we're creating a dual boot system, which means we'll be able to boot either into Windows or MX Linux. During the install process, I'll actually show you a cool method on creating a partition that we can use both in MX Linux and in Windows. So stay tuned for that. Cool, so let's jump into the computer and get right into it. Cool, so right now I'm in Windows 8.1 and so pretty much all I've done so far is I've moved all of my documents and music and files, etc., onto an external hard drive. And the reason why I did that was just to make as much room on my computer's hard drive as possible so that I have as much room as possible for the MX Linux operating system to exist on. So I'll just do one more round of cleanup before I do the install. So I'm gonna use a tool called Glary Utilities. And if you've never used Glary Utilities before, it's absolutely brilliant. It's got so many functions that can actually be found in Windows, or a lot of them can be, but it also has a lot of extra functionality. So I'm just gonna click on one click maintenance and I'll scan for issues and this shouldn't take too long to do because I've done it pretty recently anyway. So Glary Utilities is a free tool that you can use in Windows. So I'll actually speed this video up so you don't have to watch the entire process of the clean and then rejoin you once the clean has finished. Brilliant, that has completed. So I'll empty my recycle bin. And now if we check out the makeup of my hard drive, just using the disk defrag utility. And as you can see, there's plenty of space here after these files available on my internal hard drive. So I'll close out of disk defrag now and also Glary Utilities. And what I'm gonna do now is actually shrink my hard drive. So to do that, just go over to your start menu, right click, and then click on disk management. And this tool can also be found in your control panel. And I'll just expand this window a little bit. Cool, so what we're looking at here is my internal hard drive. And this is a 22 gigabyte SSD drive that I actually use for projects. So because it's a SSD drive, it's a fast access drive. So generally I'll use that for my projects. And then when I'm finished a project, I'll back all the files up to another hard drive and then clear this SSD drive. These partitions here are actually my Windows partitions. So I'm gonna leave the first two alone and this third partition, which is where the operating system and all my files exist, I'll actually shrink this partition here. So to do that, just right click and then select shrink volume and Windows will actually suggest a good size that I can shrink this partition by. And here we go, so I'll actually have 342,000 or 343,000 megabytes of hard drive space left over, which is just under half, which is perfectly fine. So I'll click shrink. And there we go. So now we have unallocated space, and this is the space that I'll be installing MX Linux onto. So I'll close out of disk management now because that is completed. And now it's time to actually download the installer. So I'll jump online. And do a search for MX Linux. It would help if I spelt it correct, but it's picked it up anyway. So mxlinux.org is the website we wanna to go to. So I'll open that. And I'm just gonna go straight to the download page by clicking this button here. And then if I scroll down a bit, these are the options that I have that I can download. So 
These three here are the XFCE versions and XFCE is a desktop environment. It's very light on system resources. So if you have an average computer or an underpowered computer or even an old computer, then the XFCE version is generally really good to use. And so we actually have the 64-bit version, the 32-bit version, and this version here, which is the advanced hardware support version. And this AHS version is really good for anyone with a newer computer. So if you actually have newer graphics cards, or you're using a 9th, 10th, or 11th gen Intel hardware, then this AHS version, or advanced hardware support version, would actually be really good. Now, the advanced hardware support version actually uses a newer kernel, Whereas both of these versions, the 64-bit and the 32-bit versions, actually use the standard long-term support release of the kernel. And these are also running Debian stable. So if you're looking for a really stable, fast operating system, then either of these would be awesome. But that said, the advanced hardware support version is generally very stable anyway. And yeah, you actually get support for newer hardware. Now, if you actually had plenty of RAM in your computer and you were using a newer computer, then you have the option to download the KDE version. Now KDE is another desktop environment. It's a lot prettier than XFCE. That said, XFCE is customizable quite a lot. So KDE has all sorts of things like blurred backgrounds and animations for your windows. So if you want a really good looking desktop environment, then the KDE version would be really good to use. And to actually customize KDE is not too difficult at all. Now, if you actually had a really low powered computer, then there is also this option here, the Fluxbox version. Now, Fluxbox isn't a desktop environment per se. It's actually a Windows manager, and Fluxbox is really, really light on your resources. But for this exercise, I'm gonna actually download the XFCE version, and I'm gonna download the 64-bit version. Now, if you weren't too sure about if your computer is a 32-bit computer or a 64-bit computer, then the easiest way to find out is just to right click your start menu and then go up to system and system can also be found in your control panel and as you can see here I'm running a 64-bit processor x64 indicates that it's a 64-bit processor as well as it says over here generally if you have a newer computer it would probably be 64-bit now if this said x 86-64, that is also a 64-bit computer, but if it said x86, and that's all it said, then that would be a 32-bit computer, or if it said i386, that also is a 32-bit computer. Cool, so I'll close out of system, and I'll just scroll down the page a little bit more, and these are the options that I have to download. So I can download it directly from the MX Linux repository, or I could use a mirror, and mirrors are basically where the ISO image or the installer is hosted, and so if you wanted to have a faster download, then downloading from a repository which is nearer to your country will generally mean that you have a faster download, and there's also an option to download the torrent. Now the benefit of downloading using a torrent is that if you had a slow internet connection, then you can always start and stop the download, and also if you actually had an underpowered computer and you had to do some work and your computer struggles running multiple applications at the same time, then you can always pause the torrent while you do your work and then go back to the torrent and continue the download. So I'm going to actually download the torrent, so I'll open that. And here is the 64-bit version. So I'll click on the 64-bit version, and I'll just save that to my downloads folder. So the torrent file itself is really small, but this is the file that we'll actually need to load into our torrent client to download the ISO image. So I actually don't have a torrent client installed on my machine right at the moment. So I'll open a new tab and do a search for Qubit Torrent. And there's many different types of torrent clients that you could use. I like using Qubit Torrent because it's a very light program. And in my experience, it's actually a really good program, very stable. So I'll open that, go to the download page, scroll down a bit, and here is a link to the Windows installer. So I'll click that. And so this version here would be the 32-bit version, and this is the 64-bit version. So I'll download that and save it to my downloads folder. If 
Fantastic. So now I'll open kubertorrent. And just go through the process of installing it. Which shouldn't take too long at all. Fantastic, that's finished. So I'll click finish and this will actually launch kubertorrent. And then I'll go back to my torrent file and I'll just double click that and that will load that into kubertorrent. So this is going to download into my downloads folder. So I'll just click OK for that. And there we go, the download has started. So I'll just move this window to the right a little bit and then go back to my web browser and I'll close that tab now. And so while that's downloading, I'm actually gonna download another program. And this is a program to actually put the ISO image or the installer onto a USB drive. So the recommended program is a program called Rufus. So I'll do a look search for that. And here is the official website. So I'll just go straight to the downloads page. Rufus.ie and I'll just download the top one, which is the latest version. And I'll save that to my downloads folder as well. And there's actually another program. This is a program that I prefer using, and I'll tell you why when I demonstrate it. And it's a program called Ventoy. So I'll just go to the downloads page as well, and it's ventoy.net. And there is a Windows and a Linux version, whereas with Rufus, there is only the windows.exe file. So I'll go back to Ventoy, and I'll just click on the link to the Windows zip file. And I'll scroll down this page, the GitHub page, and I'll download the Windows zip file. Save that to my downloads folder. Now, if you are actually using a Mac to create a bootable USB drive, then a program that you could use is a program called Bellina Etcher. And here is the official website and it's bellina.io. And just be aware that there are other websites that are hosting like copies of the Bellina Etcher installer. And there's a few of them that will actually install malware on your computer if you don't go to the official website. So Bellina.io, that's the official website. So I'll open that. And Bellina Etcher is a really simple tool to use. And as you can see, if I scroll down the page a bit, there is a 64 and 32 bit version for Windows. There's a version for Mac and for Linux as well. So I'm not actually going to download that. I'll close that page. Now Rufus is absolutely brilliant. And the reason why it's recommended is because it will actually auto detect your file system of your computer. So if you're actually going to create a bootable USB drive on the computer that you're going to install the Linux distro onto, then because Rufus auto detects your file system, it actually means that you have a very high likelihood of having a successful install. Ventoy is similar, it has the same functionality as Rufus, but the cool thing about Ventoy is that you can actually put multiple installers onto a single USB drive, whereas with Rufus you can only do one at a time. Cool, so everything's downloaded, I'll now jump into my downloads folder. And I can now close out of my web browser. And here are our downloaded files. Now this .exe file is actually the program itself and it's the same with Ventoy. So I'll firstly extract Ventoy. 
And because this Ventoy program, as well as the Rufus program, are the programs themselves, so what I'm going to do is actually put both of these files into my program files directory. So I'll open up another file browser window, and then I'll navigate to my program files directory, which is in my C drive. And here it is here, program files. And then what I'll do is I'll just drag the extracted Ventoy folder directly into my program files directory. And then I'll create a folder for Rufus. So control shift N will create a new folder. And I'll name this Rufus. And then I'll just drag the Rufus program into the Rufus folder. And now what I want to do is actually create a couple of launches in my start menu. So I'll open up firstly the Rufus directory and then right click on the exe file and pin to start. And then I'll go up folder and do the same for Ventoy. Right click, pin to start. Cool, so now if I open up my start menu, here are the launches. So I'll just drag these over here. And then launch Rufus. So I'll close out of that file browser window. And I'll minimize the downloads folder. And there we go, the download has completed, so I can now delete that from KubeTorrent. And then I'll quit KubeTorrent. And now I'll grab my USB drive and put it into my computer. And Rufus has picked up the USB drive, so now I'll go over to Select. And here is the ISO image, or the .iso file that we want to load onto the USB drive. So I'll select that, click open, and that's now loaded into Rufus. Now the partition scheme and the target system have been auto detected by Rufus, so I'll leave those as is. And so I'll just name the USB stick, so actually I'll go back to select, and I'll just double click slowly. Control C to copy, cancel out of there. And then for the volume label, I'll paste the name, Control V to paste. And I'll leave all of the other options as is, and then just simply click Start, and then OK to write in ISO image mode. And then OK to the warning that all of the data on the device is about to be deleted, and also all of the partitions. So this is going to create a bootable USB drive from scratch. And I'll just let that complete, so I'll speed up this little bit of the video and then rejoin you once Rufus has completed its task. Cool, that's completed. So I now have a USB drive that I can use now to install MX Linux. So that's pretty easy to do. Now what I'm going to do is actually show you my preferred method, which is to use a program called Ventoy. Now, the reason why I like to use Ventoy is, for example, I have this 32 gigabyte USB drive here. And so if this was the only drive that I had available, then I would actually have to install each ISO using Rufus one at a time if I wanted to what's called distro hop or try different Linux operating systems out. But the cool thing with Ventoy, if I throw this into my machine, is that if I were to open up my file browser window and then jump into my USB drive, so this is it here. Now, as you can see, I have 10 different installers on this one USB drive. And as well as that, I actually have a whole bunch of folders that I have on the drive as well. And that's the cool thing about using Ventoy is that not only is it good for putting Linux ISO image installers onto a flash drive, but you can also use it to move around files and folders, etc. Hence why I use Ventoy. So I'll demonstrate how to use Ventoy. So I'll just eject my flash drive. 
and then put my other flash drive in and this is a four gigabyte flash drive cool so i'll jump into my start menu and this time launch ventoy to disk and then i'll move this over to the left and as you can see ventoy has defaulted to mbr which was the same as what rufus had auto detected now if you wanted to change this which you probably wouldn't need to but if you did then you just jump over to option and then partition style and you have the option to change it here cool so i'm going to install ventoy onto this usb drive so it's now wiping the usb drive and installing the ventoy program onto the usb stick cool that is completed so i can close out of ventoy and then jump back into my file browser and then I'll open another file browser window and move this to the right. And so this is the USB drive, empty at the moment. So now that Ventoy has been installed onto the USB drive, I don't actually have to use Ventoy again unless I wanted to update the version of Ventoy that's running on the USB drive. So all I have to do now is just move a copy of the ISO images that I want on the USB drive and just copy them to Ventoy and it's that simple. So what I'll do is I'll actually move two onto the USB drive. So let's see what's the smallest one. Probably Fedora, so I'll just move that as well. And now I'll close out of my installers file browser. And I'll just let these copy onto my USB drive. So I'll fast forward this a little bit and then rejoin you once the transfers have completed. Cool, that's completed, so I'll close my file browser window. So there's only one thing left to do before I reboot the computer, and that is to make sure that fast startup is turned off. So if I right click my start menu, and then go up to power options. And then click on choose what the power buttons do. And this can also be found in your control panel. And I see here the fast startup I've already turned off. So I actually had to turn that off for one of the programs that I'm using. But if yours was turned on, then just go up here to change settings that are currently unavailable. And then you can turn it on and off here. So I'll leave this turned off and just cancel out of there. And so what I wanna do now is boot into my USB drive. So to do that, I actually have to go to my PC settings. So I'll open up my start menu and then I have a link here to my PC settings. And if you don't actually have it in your start menu, just do a search for PC settings, there it is there, but I'm just gonna launch it from my start menu. And then go to update and recovery, then recovery, and then click restart now. Now, if you were using an older operating system, one that was before Windows 8 or Windows 7, then you'd probably have to jump online to find out how to boot into your BIOS. Generally what you do is you shut your computer down and then power it on and then immediately either press your F2 button or your F8 button or sometimes it's F5. Quite often it'll actually show up on your screen in the top corner or somewhere on your screen as you're booting up as to which key to press to get into your BIOS settings. Because I'm using Windows 8.1, it's actually called the UEFI settings, but it's the same as the BIOS. So I'm gonna click restart now, and then that'll boot into the BIOS. Cool, so I'll click restart now. And so this will actually boot into my advanced startup options. And here we go, so I'll firstly click on troubleshoot and then advanced options, and then UEFI firmware settings. So this is the same as booting into your BIOS on an older computer. 
Cool, so here I am in my UEFI settings. And there's a couple of things that I need to do first before booting into the USB drive. So I'll firstly go over to security and then make sure that my secure boot control has been turned off. Now, if I didn't do that, then I wouldn't actually be able to use the USB drive. I'd get a warning that I wouldn't be able to use the USB drive. Cool, then I'll go over to boot and I'll make sure that fast boot has been disabled and then go to my boot order priorities. And if I leave this as is, then basically the computer will boot normally into Windows, but I actually wanna change that. So I'll select that and then choose my USB drive. And that's pretty much it. So I'll now go over to save and exit and then reboot the computer by clicking save and exit. And here we are now in the USB drive. Now, because I loaded two Linux installers onto this USB drive, then as you can see here, I have multiple that I can choose from. So that was just to show you the power of Ventoy. So I'll select the MX21 installer and then click enter. And here we are in the first screen. So we have the option to change the language, our keyboard layout and the time zone, so I'll actually do that here. And if you didn't change it here, then you still have the option to change it once you're in the installer. So firstly, I'll change my language and English, English, and then I'll use UK English. And then for the keyboard, because of the keyboard layout on this laptop that I'm using is using the default US layout, then I'll select that. And then for the time zone, and then back to the main menu, and now that I've changed those settings, I'll now boot into the MX21 installer. So MX21 is dubbed Wildflower. Of course, here we are in the MX Linux operating system. So currently MX Linux is running off the USB drive, but I'm about to install it onto my computer hard drive. So this is the welcome screen that we encounter first. And there are plenty of things you can explore here from FAQs to user manuals to forums, videos. If you wanted to contribute to the project, then I'm sure that the MX Linux team would welcome that. We have popular apps if you wanted to install some apps. And if you want to actually start customizing MX Linux from here or go exploring or anything like that, and you make any changes, there's actually a function in the installer where you can save the changes that you make and it applies it to your installs. So it's a very cool function. We also have the tour here, and this tour is absolutely brilliant. So if you're absolutely new to Linux or new to MX Linux in particular, then just have a little explore of this tour and it will actually show you pretty much everything you need to know about MX Linux. So absolutely brilliant. Cool, so I'll close out of the tour. And if I jump over to the About tab, we can see here that we're running MX21 and the XFCE version is 4.16.0. MX Linux is based on Debian 11.1, so it's the stable Debian version. And the brilliant thing about MX Linux is it actually is supported all the way to June 2024. So all of the updates or security patches or anything like that, you'll actually be able to receive them all the way up until 2024. So it's very cool. And because it's very stable, you'll actually be able to use this for quite some time. Cool, so I'll close out of the welcome screen and then go over to the installer, which is on the desktop and click that once. And this is the MX Linux installer. Now, this installer is native to MX Linux and it's absolutely brilliant. There's quite a few things you can do here, which you actually can't do in many of the other installers that you find for other operating systems. Now, a quick tour of this, we have help and instructions to the left in the live log tab this is actually sort of a terminal emulator so this will show you what's going on in the background i'll go back to help and let's get started with the install so i've already changed my keyboard settings to the default us keyboard layout but if you hadn't have done that then simply click on change keyboard settings and if your keyboard model is in this drop down menu then you can just select it from there or you can just select the keyboard layout language in this field here so just click on the plus button and then from this drop down menu you can choose 
your computer's keyboard language. So I'm going to leave mine on the default US keyboard layout and then click OK. Actually it's added that to the keyboard layout so I'll delete that and then apply and OK. And we're back in the MX Linux installer. So I'll just move this to the left a little bit. And I'll drag this bigger. Now, to actually find the corner is quite difficult. Oh, I actually got it right there. Because to actually get the corner, you're actually looking for something that's one pixel by one pixel. So it's very small. That said, it's actually really easy to solve. You just go up to your title bar and right click. And then select resize. And that automatically throws your cursor to the corner. And when we actually customize MX Linux, there's actually a theme that we can use which widens the borders. So it makes dragging windows larger and smaller really, really easy. So I'll just drag that a little bit bigger and then click Next. And because I'm going to dual boot this computer with Windows and install it alongside it, I'm going to leave it on Customize the Disk Layout and then click Next. And so before we can actually use the screen, because the space on the hard drive that I've made available is currently unallocated, I'm going to go over to this button here which will launch the Gparted application. So Gparted is a Linux partitioning tool that you can use. So I'll drag this bigger as well. And so here is the unallocated space that I'm going to use. So I'm going to do some partitioning now and I'm doing this specifically for use with Windows. So the first partition I'm going to create will actually be a partition that I can use both in Windows and in MX Linux. So I'm going to make this about 100 gigabytes in size. That'll be plenty big enough. So in this field here where it says size in megabytes, because 1024 megabytes makes up one gigabyte, I'll type in 1024 and then press tab and that's 100 gigabytes. So for the file system, because I want Windows to be able to see this partition as well, from this drop down menu, I'll just click and hold and then select NTFS because that is the file system that Windows can read. And then for the label, I'll call this dual data and then click add. Cool, so now I'll go back to the unallocated space. Right click that again, select new. So I'm going to create two more partitions, one for the operating system and all my files, and the second partition will be for my swap partition. Now, what a swap partition is, is kind of a, an extension of your RAM. So if you don't have much RAM in your computer and you plan on doing some quite RAM intensive work on your computer, then by not having a swap file, when you run out of RAM, you can actually freeze your program and lose your work or sometimes even freeze your computer and have to reboot. But by having a swap file, when your RAM is actually filled up, then it'll actually throw the data that can't fit onto your RAM into your swap file. So it's kind of an extension of RAM. Now you can't really rely on swap as RAM, you're better off actually upgrading your RAM because to actually use a swap partition is a lot slower than if you were actually using RAM. So I'm actually going to go down to my apps menu and then look for a calculator. There it is, calculator it's called, so I'll open that. And so the general rule of thumb is to create a swap partition about the same size as your RAM. So I have six gigabytes of RAM in my computer, so what I'll do is I'll go six times 1024. And so 6,144 megabytes is equal to six gigabytes of RAM. Cool, so I'll just drag that to the right a bit. And then back in Gparted, so because the swap partition is going to follow my operating system and files and all that, I'm actually gonna place this at the end of the drive. So I'll come down to free space following, and in that field, I'll type in 6144 and then press tab, and there we go. So what I'm doing now is creating this partition, and it's gonna have a six gigabyte space after this partition where I can then create a swap partition. Now for the file system, I'm gonna change this to 
BTRFS, otherwise known as ButterFS. Now the reason why I'm doing that is so that when I do system snapshots, which is kind of the Linux version of a system restore point, then by using ButterFS, it's almost instantaneous when you make a snapshot, whereas if I were to use ext4, which is the normal file system that Linux uses, and it's a very stable, fast file system, but every time I would actually create a snapshot, then it would take a lot longer than using ButterFS. And ButterFS is actually very powerful and very stable as well anyway. So for the label, I'm just going to call this MX21, and then click Add. And then my last bit of space, which is six gigabytes, so I'll just right click that, select new, and then from the file system, change that to Linux swap. And then for the label, I'll call this MX swap. Cool, so we've now created a 100 gigabyte NTFS partition that can be used in both MX Linux and in Windows. We've got our MX Linux partition here, and then we have a MX Linux swap partition. Cool, so that's all good. I'll now go up here to the tick, and then press that to apply the operations. And I can close calculator now. And so this shouldn't take too long to do, but I'll fast forward this and then rejoin you once it's completed anyway. Fantastic, that's completed, so I can close out of that, and I'll just close Gparted, we don't have to get that to read now. And so now the MX Linux installer will do a quick scan to see the changes. And there we go, so here are our new partitions that we've created. So for this first partition, I don't actually have to do anything to that, it's already formatted to NTFS, so I'll leave that blank. I'll go down to the MX swap partition and then from this drop down menu select swap. So for this MX Linux partition, I actually want to create two sub volumes. So basically, what I'm going to do is create a sub volume for my root, which is where all my system files and the operating system exist, and then a second sub volume for where all my documents and music and images and all that will reside. So to do that, go to this field here and select format and then in the format field change that to butterfs cool and then go over here to sda6 or whatever it's called on your computer and then right click that and let's create a couple of sub volumes so I'll right click and create another sub volume cool so now we have two sub volumes here that we need to allocate usage for so from this drop down menu I'll choose root for the first sub volume and then from the second one I'll choose home for the second sub volume. Now the reason why I did it this way and didn't actually create separate partitions, which you can do, is because I'm using time shift, time shift will actually pick up that because this is labeled ampersand or and symbol, then this is my root volume and because this is labeled at home, then time shift, which is taking my snapshots, will recognize that this is where all my files are. So that's all good. Now, I'll just take note that up here on my Windows partitions, I actually have an ESP partition, which is the bootloader for Windows. And so what I'm going to do is actually include an MX Linux bootloader or grub menu on the same partition. Now currently the Windows grub menu takes up about I think about 40 megabytes of space so there's definitely plenty of room here for me to use the same partition for the MX Linux grub menu or bootloader. And I'll also take note that it's SDA2 which is where the Windows bootloader resides. So I'll click next and if I wanted to double check or triple check then I can just make sure that these are the changes that I'm going to use. So I'm not going to reformat the Windows bootloader, but I will be formatting SDA6, which is where we created our partitions for MX Linux. SDA7 is where the swap partition is, that's it there. And then SDC2, which is the Ventoy USB drive, that will actually be left as is, so it's no reformat there. So that's all good, so I'll click yes to continue. 
and SDA2 it's defaulted to, so I'll leave that as is because that's where the MX Linux grub menu will reside. And so when I boot up my computer, I'll actually have the option from the grub menu to either boot into Windows or into MX Linux. So I'll leave that as is. Click next and then choose my computer name. So this is what my computer will be named on a network. So if I left it as MX, which is the default, and I actually installed MX Linux onto multiple computers and they were all called MX, then it might be a bit difficult to figure out which one was which. So I'll call this MX21 hyphen K65 CM because that's the brand of laptop. I won't worry about changing the computer domain because I can always do that later. And the work group I'll leave as is. This Samba server, this is if you were planning on doing Microsoft networking. So for example, if you were going to create a gaming pod with some friends and you wanted to use Microsoft networking on your Linux machine, then you'd leave this enabled, but I don't actually plan on doing that. So I'll disable that and then click next and then edit my locales. So let's choose Australia. And then for the time zone, Australia. And I'm going to leave it on 12 hour time. For the service settings, if I click that, it's generally a good idea to leave all of these enabled. But if you knew specifically that you didn't want one of these or multiple of these installed, then you could just deselect them. I know that this laptop doesn't have Bluetooth, so I'll deselect that and click OK. And then next. And then my login username and password. Now, if you were actually setting up a computer to share, like in the lounge or anything like that, and you wanted to set it up and give out the password for everyone to be able to log in, then you just share this password here. But if you didn't want other people to actually make changes to the system, then you could actually create an administrator password. And that way you'd actually need to know this password to say install or delete programs or make changes to your system settings. But I'm gonna deselect that because I'll be the only one using this laptop. Now I'll leave auto login turned off. And then this field here, save live desktop changes, is absolutely brilliant. So I'll select that because I've actually downloaded and installed a program called Simple Screen Recorder to actually record this session. So by ticking this box here, my Simple Screen Recorder install will actually be included as part of the operating system. So when I reboot, I won't have to reinstall Simple Screen Recorder. Cool, so I'll click next. And we're in the home stretch of the installs. If I just turn on the live log. Now I'll speed up this a little bit and then rejoin you once the install has completed. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel and I'd appreciate it immensely. So thanks again and let's get back into the video. And there we go, the install has completed. So I can just click this finish button and that will actually reboot the computer into the grub menu and from there I'll be able to choose whether I start into MX Linux or Windows. So I'll turn off my simple screen recorder recording and then show you the reboot process. And here we are in the grub menu. So I can choose to boot into Windows by selecting this option here, or boot into MX Linux by selecting this option. So I'll boot into MX Linux. And I'll enter my login password. Cool, so I've now booted into MX Linux and this is installed on my hard drive. So I'll just close out of the welcome screen. And if I open up my file browser and in the devices, here is my dual data partition that I'll be sharing with Windows. So currently it's grayed out, which means it's not actually mounted. So to actually mount the drive, you just have to select it. And now it's loaded. So what I'm going to do is actually show you how you can auto mount this drive here so you don't actually have to click it every time you log in or boot up your machine. So what I'll do is I'll unmount the drive and then close my file browser. 
and then go to my apps menu or start menu. And so now I wanna actually install a program. So in the search field, I'll type in install and I wanna open this program here called Synaptic Package Manager. And so the Synaptic Package Manager has been around for ages. It's a favorite of many Linux users because you're able to not only install programs from here, but also kernels and you can add repositories all using the Synaptic Package Manager. And it's actually really simple to use. So in the quick filter, I'm gonna do a search for gnome-disk-utility. Here it is there. So I'll select that, right click it, mark for installation, and then apply. Then I'll press apply again, and this will now download the package files. And now it'll actually install the program. So I'll select this automatically close after the changes have been successfully applied and that will close this dialog. There we go, so it's now installed. And as you can see here from this installed version, we now have the version number here. So a very easy way to check if something is installed on your computer or not is by looking in this column here. If it's blank, it means it's not installed. If I actually click this installed version twice, then it'll actually load everything installed at the top of the list. So these are all the packages that are actually installed. So there's quite a few. So that's cool. So I'll close out of the Synaptic Package Manager and now go back to my apps menu. So I'll actually press my super key on my computer, which is the Windows key. And that opens the apps menu and then do a search for disks. There it is there. So this is the program that I just installed. So I'll open that and I'll move this to the left and then select my computer's hard drive. And as you can see here, these are all my partitions. So currently anything that has a play button means that those drives are mounted. But this dual data partition that I created for use with Windows and MX Linux currently doesn't have anything in the corner. So what I'll do is I'll select it. So let's edit the settings now. So I'll go to the settings cog here and then select edit mount options, turn off the user session defaults, and then in the display name, I'll name it. So it's dual data, and that's good. So I'll click OK, throw in my login password, and we've now made the changes to this partition. So next time I reboot the computer, it will actually auto mount, which is really good. And if I wanted to actually mount it now, I can just go over to this play button, throw in the old password, and now that's mounted. So if I now reopen my file browser window, so Windows key E, which is the same shortcut as Windows, as you can see, dual data has now been mounted. So that's pretty much it. Now I'll show you the power of the shared partition. So if I open up dual data and currently it's empty so I'll open up a new file browser window and I'll just go into my project SSD drive and I'll just drag one folder over and now if I reboot into Windows And this time I'll select Windows Boot Manager. And I'll log into Windows now. Cool, so here I am back in Windows. So if I open up my file browser window, as you can see here is my dual data partition that I created. And here's the folder that I copied across when I was in MX Linux. So it's a very easy way of being able to work on files regardless of whether you're in MX Linux or in Windows. Now, if you actually wanted to return your computer back to 
a pure Windows only machine, then this is what you do. So firstly, I wanna delete the Grub menu from the Windows bootloader, and that way, when we reboot the computer, we'll actually boot straight into Windows. So to do that, go to your Start menu and right click, and then run the Command Prompt application, or PowerShell if you're using Windows 10 or 11. And I'll maximize this window here. And then the program that I'm going to use is a program called Disk Parts. So just type that in. And so that's now running. So because I'm going to edit the EFI partition where the Grub menu has been placed, I'll firstly have to find where it is. So to find that out, type in list volume. And because I know that the Grub menu is 100 megabytes in size, it will be this FAT32 partition here. So I'll take note that it is volume four. So to select volume four, I would type in select vol space four. Oops, I didn't leave a space, so I'll try that again. Select vol space four. And now we can see that volume four is the selected volume. So if I now open up a file browser window, and I'll just move this to the right. And so this will actually show us what we're about to do. So now I'll go back to the command prompt, and I wanna actually allocate a letter to this volume. So to do so, type in assign space letter equals with no space, and then we just have to choose a volume letter that isn't being used. So currently I'm using C, D, and V. So I'll just type in Z. And Z will now appear, here we go. It's now appeared in our devices and drives of our file browser. So now we wanna actually enter this folder and if I try to double click it, then I won't have much luck, so I'll close out of there. So the way to actually enter this folder is you go to your Start menu and right-click it, and then select Task Manager. And the shortcut to open Task Manager is Control alt delete on your keyboard. You just press those keys at the same time. Cool, so now go up to File and Run New Task. And then go over to your Browse button, and let's browse to the Z drive. So there it is there. And so this folder here is what we want to edit, so I'll open that. And all you have to do is delete this MX21 folder, which contains the Grub menu. So I'll just press Delete. And that's done. So I'll leave everything else in the folder, so we can actually boot back into Windows. Then simply click cancel and cancel and we can close the task manager now and so what I want to do now is actually remove this letter so I'll go back to my command prompt and type in remove letter equals Z and we are done so now I can close out of the command prompt and also my file browser window And so the very last thing to do is actually return the hard drive back to the state that it was in before we partitioned it. So go back to your Start menu, right-click, go up to Disk Management. And I'll just drag this window bigger so we can see what's going on. And all you have to do now is just right-click on, firstly, the Swap Partition and just select Delete. then select the MX Linux main partition, and then delete that as well. And we no longer have use for this dual data partition, so I'll just right click that and select delete. And that will delete all the data on it, so if you did actually have files that you wanted to back up, then you would definitely do that before deleting this, so I'll delete that. And it's saying that it's currently in use. So I'll just select yes to force the deletion of this partition. 
There we go. And now I'll go to my C drive and right click that and then select extend and then just follow the next, next and finish. And there we go. We've now returned the C drive or the C partition back to where it was. So it's now taking up the entire computer and we've deleted all traces of our MX Linux install from our computer. There we go. So the final things to do is of course, right click your start menu and choose power options. And then click on choose what the power buttons do. And from here, you could just change settings that are currently unavailable and then turn on fast startup. But because I'm using a program called Veracrypt, I actually need this turned off. So I'll just cancel out of there. And the very final thing to do is to reboot into the UEFI settings or the BIOS as it's otherwise known. So to do that, you can either do the start menu, PC settings, update and recovery, recovery, and then press restart now, or there's actually a quicker way of doing it, which is simply to go to your start menu and then right click it and then hold down the shift key on your keyboard hover over, shut down or sign out. And with the shift key on your keyboard still pressed, then you would press restart. And this will actually reboot into the advanced startup settings. So I'm gonna do that now. And here we are in our advanced startup menu. So I'll go to troubleshoot and then advanced options, and then UEFI firmware settings, then click restart. And now in my UEFI settings, I'll go over firstly to security, and then turn on secure boot control again, then go over to boot, and then enable fast boot. And so what I wanna do now is actually delete this boot option one. So because I've actually deleted that grub menu from the EFI folder, then when my computer boots up, it actually looks for this grub menu first. And because it doesn't find it, it then boots up using the Windows Boot Manager. So what I'm gonna do now is actually select boot option one, which is what the computer will boot into first, and then select Windows Boot Manager. And then what I'm gonna do is actually delete this. So if I just go down to delete boot option and select that, and then press enter again, then I'll select this MX21 bootloader. And that has now been deleted. So if I press escape, you'll see that there is only one boot option that I have available to me here. So now I'll go over to save and exit. So this will essentially reboot my computer back into Windows absolutely normally. So I'll just click yes to save the configuration and exit. So if I just open that, log in, and there we go, full circle. So we're back in Windows and now there is no trace of MX Linux. So in the next episode, I'm actually going to do an install of MX Linux and this time I'll actually install it onto an external hard drive and that way I'll actually be able to carry around this operating system on an external hard drive. Now the process will be essentially the same as if you were going to wipe your computer of Windows or Mac OS and install MX Linux onto it. And then the following video, I'll actually show you how you can easily customize MX Linux. And there's actually not much to do. It's such a powerful, stable, and fast operating system that is very quick to set up. Now, if this video helped you in any way, then please leave us a like. Or if you'd like to ask questions or just dialogue, then leave a comment and I'll try to get back to you. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel and you'd like to see more of these videos, then just hit the subscribe button. So thanks for tuning in, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next video. Thank you.